Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure it has been a long day. I will just go you briefly through an interesting case which I encountered in our practice. Uh, so, basically, I will just go directly to the case. So, we'll go through the clinical presentation, challenges, and lessons. The case is basically about a neonate who presented with a rare condition of a persistence of preventricular tachycardia. So, as a background for the baby, he's a full termer, 40 plus weeks. His uninaptable pregnancy, apart from gestational diabetes, he got a smooth transition upon delivery. He got the normal anthropometric measures and he was for routine care till discharge. Parents were confident, they went home, they came for follow up. There was no issue till the day presentation at the 16 of life when they crashed to the emergency. With acute change of color of the baby, persistent crying, shortness of praise. By going through the history, there was no history suggestive of any infection, contact with sick people, or any kind of material or drug exposure. Having mentioned that, but when we uh, started asking more about the history, there was a positive family history for arrhythmia from the maternal side. For the primary assessment, the patient was restless, dusky, irritable, with a heart rate reaching 270 to 90 as per the EKG on the right side where we can see an R complex tachycardia. The patient was poorly perfused, he was mottled, with signs of heart failure in the uh, in the um, the view of crackles in the lungs, there was hepatomegaly, because the people was earth with moving a lot, there was unreliable SATs for 16 to 99. We did the emergency by giving oxygen surprising masks. We started vigorous stimulation as per tasks through ice packs. We had no effect. We were lucky to get a big vein in the cavitar fossa. We started adenosine at three doses 100, 250, 350 max PKG, still no response. A murder on loading at 5 mg, still no response, still SVT. We can see the EKG. Uh, this is what the adenosine effect. We can see that despite the fact there is some P waves here, for the SA node will take the lead. Still, there is some scaper as much happened before he's starting again going through a pedicardia, then eventually he goes through SVT. So during this time when lab is taking, we have the primary uh, point of care results came where the RPS is 91. There were an inevitable urea cariat, electrolytes. Having mentioned that, the gases came with a pH 7.17, it's very like severe metabolic acidosis, with a severe poor hyperperfusion selected 11.5. Antibiotics were started, then MLs of normal saline were given one hour, and patient was shifted to the ICU and non invasive ventilation. On the right, you can see the first chest X ray, you can see the rising level of mild pulmonary edema, we can see some fluffy uh, hazelness in both lung fields. Of course, after loading the amiodarone, we continued in the maintenance. Patient is still an SVT, giving the fact that the patient was improving slowly in the terms of being a little bit calm and SAS was starting to uh, reaching above 95 and oxygen was titrated. Yet, the follow up blood gases was really deteriorating. He got 6.9 and by carb of 11. So, the clinical decisions was made to start cardioversion protocol. We started 0 0.5, 1, 2 joules, still no response. Uh, we mechanically ventilated the patient electively. Uh, we started our bicarb doses and we started managing the fluid based on the point of care ultrasound given the fact the patient was failing. Then we increased the dose of myodarone uh, given the fact that the patient is not responding to 20 max pKG per minute, so guided by the cardiologist. Then we give another set of adenosine with no response and then this time we give it an almost in a central line. So a decision to give a second loading on amiodarone with no response, then a fourth DC shock was given in order to convert to sinus rhythm as per the EKG on the left side. So basically after two loadings amiodarone, four doses adenosine and four shocks, only the patient started to convert back to, to sinus rhythm. So patient was kept on amiodarone maintenance and serious plug gases was showing gradual improvement after cardioversion from 6.9 up to 7.38. Things were more or less stable till 12 hours after admission when another attack with SVT happened, which reverted by adenosine. Then in the middle of the night, there was another attack with SVT, adenosine no response, looting another looting amiodarone, no response, another DC shock, no response. So the patient was kept on amiodarone at 20 max pKG per minute. At this point of time, clinically, it was more or less acceptable perfusion and PP was fine. So we started on ismolol IV based on the cardiologist's recommendations. 
and in order to control the heart rate and uh, we started by rating based on the pp and perfusion reaching up to 150 marks pkg per minute till the point where the heart rate was around 180s but it's still in our complex with no p waves so uh, my and ismail over the coming few days were gradually weaned based on the patient clinical stability up to the point ismail was totally stopped we need to stop it as early as possible it's a beta blocker he's in heart failure Flicanide was introduced at 2 milligrams per EKG per, uh, every 12 hours as per the cardiologist's recommendation. Having mentioned that, the EKG was started showing a white complex, uh, 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 quite complex QRS with distorted B wave, like in the upper left EKG. Then patient was stable to around day three of admission. Uh, around 2 a.m., we started having a white complex tachycardia-like picture with mottling cyanosis, where you got another DC shock with no response. So as per recommendation of cardiologists, we escalated the dose back to 20 mics. We started having some sinus rhythm with some heart to block and escape rhythm of around 120 to 150 ventricular, as we see. So here we can see like there was a white QRS and a BTAC-like picture. Then we got the sinus rhythm with some escape rhythm. Then uh, after this, we escalated the dose on myodron 20 mics, but after the heart to block, we stopped the myodron and we stopped the flicanide. I stopped the myodron and we skipped one dose of flicanide. And slowly, slowly, the patient started to regain control through the sinus rhythm to the point it was back to sinus rhythm with some distorted P waves. I'm not sure if these distorted P waves or not, even the cardiologist. So even so, the patient was a stable of flicanide this is charged, there is a lot of challenges in the patient. Uh, if you can see the videos on the left side, we can see this is the how well the heart was contracting. It was very weak contractility, ejection fraction was around 30. You can see the smoking of the blood. And this is one of the signs where there is increased um, incidence of thrombosis. This is why we started the antipilia measure, some small dose diuretics, plus uh, we started milirinone based on the PP titrated slowly, slowly, and we stopped the ismilol and we gave small dose aspirin to avoid the um, uh, thrombosis. Later on, as we start the antibiotic measures, you can see the second video, how the heart is contracting nicely with ejection fraction around 50-60%. Uh, of course, we have to keep all of this while managing metabolic acidosis, electrolytes from eustasis. We were concerning about the nutrition of the patient. We have to put our central lines. Uh, one of the major challenges that this is, we did have a very rare guidance in literature and evidence-based medicine for persistent SVT, especially in newborns, even in adults and pediatrics. There is no case series about it, uh, even there is no case scenarios, and uh, most of the experiences from the centers is actually what we experience in our clinical experience, which like 70-80% respond to medications nicely, and even the rest of them just by the first job, they respond nicely. And of course, we have a uh, huge challenge with communication with the parents, breaking bad news, how with the patient is progressing. At one point, we were counseling the parents that the patient um, is not doing nicely, and we, we are not sure if we're going to respond to medication nicely or not. But we have to keep them informed and we have to get them updated and we have to communicate with the whole team, doctors, nurses, subspecialties, in order to make sure the patient will have the optimum care. Having mentioned that, the patient would discharge home safely and we're still receiving emails from the parent thanking us for saving his life. And despite the fact it's a rare case, but the patient up to this point, according to the development, is doing nicely. It's a little bit too early to know how it's doing neurodevelopmental wise, but the initial scans uh, were showing assuring signs, hopefully. So lessons and important points learned from this case is the teamwork. This is the most important part, to be honest, like the doctors, the nurses, uh, the multi-speciality, even the uh, allied uh, services, uh, they all will like contributing in harmony in order to achieve the best outcome. Proper training is very important. Uh, it's only a few neonatologists who have been uh, trained to do the DC shock on newborns, and we don't do it frequently. And having a well-trained team in order to use the defibrillator nicely with a good um, uh, pro protocol in order not to delay the treatment is one of the key factors. Communication, communication, communication among cardiologists and neonatologists, uh, the light health, uh, the parents. Uh, uh, we have a whole panel like the cardiologists. We have uh, opinions from UK, from US, from Egypt, from India, from everywhere trying because this is a rare case. We don't encounter a lot. We don't have any rare We have a very rare guidance what to do and we have to give uh, our best uh, choices based on the physiology and our experiences. Family management, it challenges with antiarrhythmias. Uh, we have to face it with pediatricians and neonatologists. Uh, we know uh, maybe the first, second line of antiarrhythmic medication, but antiarrhythmic medications represent 
a huge challenge for us. Uh, proper monitoring and early intervention, we have seen one of the EKGs showing a wide cure as maybe at this point if you intervened a little bit early, you might have avoided the VTAC. Uh, but still, because we have a system of plan A, plan B, plan C, we used to discuss it with the whole team. What if this scenario happened? What if this scenario happened? So usually there's uh, proper monitoring and early intervention. And this gives me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to receive any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sodiman. I mean, excellent presentation and well summed up in terms of uh, especially focus on the family, team working, and uh, multidisciplinary input. And obviously, uh, a rare scenario like this where the people involved, uh, even though they are experts in the field, they have not really faced as many cases, makes it more challenging, not mm -hmm. enough evidence in the literature. And so you have to draw on your experience and the cardiologist's experience in managing but thankfully the baby did well. So uh, there are a couple of uh, questions in terms of- uh, If you have time, I can go through the questions. Um, Which one so, you can type the questions, you mean? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean in like... terms of uh, Dr. Abdullahi's presentation, a couple of comments were there about uh, G6PD deficiency. And uh, I mean, uh, that father's G6PD should not affect the baby. So just to clarify in a boy, obviously, the father only gives the Y chromosome. So if it is a boy, the G6 period yes. doesn't come from the uh, father in any case. In the terms you're of right. the girl, I mean, you might have, uh, yeah, yes, Dr. Abdullahi, please ask. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you very much. I have, I read already the comment about the father and the mother, they are both uh, relatives. And definitely it's not coming from the father because the father, he's having a G6BD deficiency as well as he has uh, uh, sickle cell uh, anemia. Uh, but the mother, they are related. So definitely, and he's a boy. He, so definitely the, the, the genes comes from the, from the mother. And uh, for uh, Dr. Soliman, I mean, uh, just one quick thing. I mean, what is the advice you would give uh, families? Uh, I mean, when they come across such cases where there is a family history and uh, a child presents with arrhythmia? Uh, so usually we give the family the same uh, protocol for early alarming signs and what we should do about it and how to respond to it and how to come to the hospital as early as possible. The patient was referred to a cardiac center in Jalila, they implanted a pacemaker, uh, not a pacemaker, like uh, a halter-like device, a cutaneous where they can monitor the arrhythmia all the time. But he did a great job and usually we encourage him that to come to the emergency if there's any concern. And of course, a lot of medication should be avoided, which is more related to the arrhythmia and we give them the list that these things should be avoided. And if you have any concern, please don't hesitate to come to us. Um, just a couple of questions. I think Dr. Meyer is asking about antithrombotic. Yes, we used aspirin with ejection fraction less than 30. We are afraid of thrombosis, so we use small dose aspirin. Uh, cardiac ablation is a cardiology decision later on, usually it's not done. Unfortunately, 70-80% of these cases will not be diagnosed. Only 20-30% after electrophysiology, they might have ablation. Uh, this shock maximum limit of recurrence. Uh, we don't have any literature for it. PALS is recommended three times, but after this, we don't know. But if it's not working, we should, jump, we should not keep on doing it. Genetic testing done for this child concerning maternal history, these absolutely needed, and a genetic referral was done to a genetist in order to see if there is any underlying condition. The junction considered at any time, um, yes, it was considered among other antiarrhythmic, but it was a panel of cardiologists who decide about it. Um, there were a beta blocker, including embryology in treatment unit SVT. Uh, yes, we used beta blocker, but in emergency, we use ismolol rather than interol. It has uh, an intravenous uh, axis. It has a very short acting uh, action and it can be weaned easily rather than enderol, which might have um, a lower safety profile. Having mentioned that the patient is trusted charged on flicanide and enderol because we need it. Uh, can we vent heart failure in your point? Is it during pregnancy? So it's a huge topic. <laughs> what level of sedation you give to patient during DCT shock when he was on non-invasive ventilation? So in non-invasive ventilations, uh, at this point, we have our protocol. There are different agents are being used. It's a very good question. So where I got my training, we use a small dose metazolam and use a small dose morphia for DC shock, not for the ventilation. For non-invasive ventilations, we're more into uh, dexamorphine, which is the presidex, but we still is an emergency if you need really sedation during non-invasive. But for I DC shock- uh, The rest of the questions we will take, you can type the answers to them. If I think I clear them all. <laughs> very yeah. yeah, so I think uh, we will move on to the next session because we're running late. Thank you both very much for very useful and excellent presentations. Thank you.